Hello and welcome to another episode of the Emil Barna podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Scott Miller. Scott's the founder of the International Center for Clinical Excellence, which is a consortium of clinicians, educators, and even people like policymakers to find the best way to improve service delivery, especially in things like health and counseling and welfare and that sort of stuff. Scott has been super involved when it comes to building a clinician's better way of working to be a better version of themselves and delivering better practice. So in today's interview, we kind of run through a whole range of what makes a clinician, a therapist, a psychotherapist, counselor, whatever you want to call them, how to be the best at your profession. And spoiler alert, it's not going to ongoing training. So it's really important to understand and to work through this particular episode if you want to improve your practice and become a better, better, better clinician. We talk about things as far ranging as spiritual practices and individual counseling practices of certain uh, practitioners, including my own experiences. And we even go into the UFC and mixed martial arts and and using those as analogies to continue ongoing improvement, identifying where you're lacking and figuring out where to move forward with. So without any further hesitation, let's just jump on into the interview and we'll take it from there. Hello, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me on my show on the Emil Barna podcast. And uh, it's really, for me, it's really exciting to have you on board because I've been familiar with your work for quite a while as a clinician. And now I get to sit uh, via screen with you on the other side of the world uh, on two different time zones, picking your brain for the next hour. So thank you so much for, for touching base with me. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. So, Scott, for those who might not be familiar with your work or your name, uh, can you give our listeners a bit of an introduction on who you are, what you do, and uh, that sort of stuff? Sure. At the present time, I direct a not-for-profit organization called the International Center for Clinical Excellence. We're on the web at iccexcellence.com. And it is one of the largest groups of mental health providers in the world devoted to improving the results of individual practitioners. And for really most of my career, I've had an interest in trying to figure out how I could be more helpful to more people. And that sent me on a long and circuitous journey through a particular approach to doing care through common factors, looking at what the elements were that cut across different treatment approaches and accounted for their effectiveness to the measurement and use of measurement in care to get feedback from clients in order to facilitate more engagement, prevent dropout and improve outcomes. And then most recently, all of that ongoing measurement, literally tens of thousands of therapists and millions of clients around the world, we've become quite interested in what's called deliberate practice, which to date, it appears is one of the only evidence-based approaches for improving the outcomes of practitioners at the individual practitioner level. You know, we've always assumed that if we got training, if we learned a particular model or were supervised in a particular approach that our results would be continuously improving. And what the research literature says is that therapist confidence improves but their outcomes do not improve with time, experience, or training. And deliberate practice, this focused effort at the edge of your clinical performance where your outcomes begin to fail and attending to that is where the possibility of improved treatment results comes from. That's that's, that's huge. It's a deliberate practice. That's a kind of model uh, or framework you bring to understanding uh, how some uh, therapists get results and other therapists just just fall by the wayside. Am I understanding you? Yeah. Well, what we did 
early on was we found that there were some therapists when they began measuring their outcomes that were more effective year on year and almost regardless of who they who who they provided care to and it was a real open question about why was this even though the subject and the data the evidence for this had been around since the 1970s a psychologist by the name of david f ricks had published a paper called super shrinks where he looked at an unusually effective clinician and asked, well, what is it that accounts for this? And the field's really languished in trying to understand it. Again, instead, I think our agenda has been to emulate in many ways medicine, that what would make us effective is to codify the diagnostic system and then develop treatments, much like medicine, for each of those diagnoses. That project, in my opinion, has, has, has failed. It hasn't worked. And that's because it was, we concluded back in the 90s when we wrote our two volume series called The Heart and Soul of Change, psychotherapy doesn't work like medicine. We, we talk as if it works like medicine, but, but it really doesn't. It's about engagement and relationships and hope and expectations, uh, et cetera. So we've languished, as I said, in trying to figure out why some were more effective than others. Just so happens that I came across some research by another psychologist, but not in the clinical realm. His name was Kay Anders Ericsson, a Swedish psychologist living in the United States who'd been studying why performers in other domains, surgery, teaching, computer programming, sports, and business, excelled where most of the performers within those domains stayed fairly average or declined in their performance over time. And he suggested that what accounted for the superior performance of the select group was what he termed deliberate practice. And what that meant was continuously reaching for performance objectives just beyond the individual's current ability. And in order to do that, people had to first measure their performance. They actually had to have a baseline that was valid and reliable estimate of how they worked, with whom they worked, under what circumstances they worked to effect, and then look for when they did not succeed. Focus on that particular area, get a coach to help them develop perhaps exercises to work those weaker muscles so that they could gradually improve successfully refining their program over, over uh, their performance over time. And that's not what our field uh, has done. It's not a path that we've pursued. The very first time the two terms deliberate and practice were mentioned together in a sentence in relationship to psychotherapy was a 2007 article that we wrote called Super Shrinks that appeared in a popular source called the Psychotherapy Networker. You can search that and get it for free uh, from my particular website. And at that time, it was just a suggestion. We were, we, we were just suggesting this may account for why certain therapists are better than others. And since that time, the field and researchers have risen to the challenge and begun to provide empirical support for that. Daryl Chow, uh, who lives in Perth, Australia, was among the first. And he found that, in fact, what separated the best from the rest was not whether they did deliberate practice or not, to come back to your original question, but rather the amount of time and the amount of effort they put into their deliberate practice, with the best putting in about two and a half times more hours in the process than the average therapist. And for that effort, we're talking about small gradual improvement of those top performers over the course of their career as juxtaposed to average performers whose outcomes either stay flat or the data indicate actually deteriorate over time in terms of their performance. That's not anything that most therapists believe is true. Uh, and, and of course, that's because with time and experience, we become confident about our work. And confidence, in fact, is the kryptonite to deliberate practice. Why, why should you practice if you feel fairly good about what you, about what you do?
Ooh, that's a that's a good one, Scott. Because there's so many people as they get along in years as as a clinician. I've only I've only been in the field for uh, at the moment around seven or so seven years, and it's really interesting how the more comfortable you get the less willing you are to improve yourself if you're not like I, that's why i love doing these types of you know picking people's brains and kind of finding out a few more things that i don't really know but i do want to pick up on your point on deliberate practice for those who have never heard that term and want to understand what you mean like what what is, what is the concept of deliberate practice in terms of I'm a, I'm a clinician who, who carries on deliberate practice work versus one who's just, you know, in a lull. Uh, how, would you, how would you define it? Well, I, I think one of the, the first things is to separate it from what most of us think of when we think of practice. And in British English, practice is spelled two ways, with a C and with an S. And that helps differentiate between putting in time at the office versus putting in time at the edge of your performance. You cannot do deliberate practice in the office with your clients. You have to deliver a service. So while you can make some minor adjustments, any real effort to change your performance is something that needs to be done before you go into the room to meet a client and after. And this was the real big challenge, I think, initially for us as a team. The minute we started seeing that some therapists were more effective than others, we asked top performers to send us videos so we could watch. Now, think about that. The assumption was those top performers must be doing something inside the room that if we learned it, codified it, taught it to everybody, and they replicated it in exactly the same way, our outcomes would improve. Anders Ericsson, again, the person who invented or coined this term, would scoff at that and say, top performers in tennis aren't great because they copy each other's backhand, but rather because they spend a lot of time before the tournament working on their backhand and after a tournament perfecting what they had what they had fallen short on in terms of their backhand or whatever it is might might be there might might be the shortcoming in their in their current performance so we write extensively about the application of deliberate practice in our newest book, which came out from APA in May of 2020 called Better Results, Using Deliberate Practice to Improve Therapeutic Effectiveness. And deliberate practice, as I hope I'm making clear, isn't about practice. It's not about seeing your clients. Number two, it's not about simply rehearsing to proficiency. In fact, the enemy of deliberate practice is proficiency. Most of us stop, let's just face it, most of us stop working at it, whatever it is, our driving, uh, et cetera, the minute we achieve proficiency. And if we manage to avoid dr dramatic errors in the process. We don't have multiple car crashes. We think, hey, we're getting better and better at it. If you haven't fallen down lately, you probably think you're a pretty good walker when really the what's probably going on is that you've walked the same path over and over and over again. I mean, how challenging really is that? If you want to get better at walking, you're going to have to vary the territory that you tread. So deliberate practice, as we talk about in the new book, is about three things. The first one is measuring and establishing your baseline performance level. And this is something that therapists and our field has not done. But thankfully, in the last two decades, a variety of systems have, have, come, uh, have become available that help therapists actually develop a strong and reliable estimate about how effective they are. Once you have that data, if you think about it, we're talking about routinely administering measures in the work that you do, then looking at the aggregate data and beginning to parse it with the people, the time of day, the particular presenting complaint or problem, and looking for when you're not achieving the same kind of effects you do in general. Baseline performance is number one. Number two is then to set individualized learning objectives. That is, what exactly do you need to learn? And importantly, those learning objectives have to have leverage on outcome. 
much of the stuff we practice a field as a field has no leverage on outcome. Let me give you an example. Most techniques therapists learn in workshops have virtually no impact on outcome, but we spend a lot of time mastering, whether that's new energy-based therapies or it's confronting dysfunctional thoughts. They don't have, they, in fact, at most about 1% of the variance is accounted for by the different treatment techniques or approaches people use. So this isn't where I would start. And in the book, we talk about the factors that seem to have a large leverage on outcome. And then there's a tool that we provide called the Taxonomy of Deliberate Practice Activities. And by the way, if you're not interested in buying the book, most of this information you can get for free on my, on my website. So for example, you can access our measurement tools for free on my personal website, scottdmiller.com. When you download that particular packet of tools, you'll find what we call the TDPA, the Taxonomy of Deliberate Practice Activities, that will help you once you've measured your performance, look at your aggregate data and distill it into an individualized learning objective. So that's that second piece. The third is you're gonna need a coach. And when I'm talking about coach, I'm not talking about supervisors. You know, we have a rich tradition of supervision in our field that dates all the way back to Freud. But that's not the way top performers work, say, in sports. They don't have a single supervisor that follows them their entire career. Instead, and especially nowadays, when performances have taken on uh, such uh, high levels, a, a sports well, let's take, for example, figure skaters, female figure skaters, even male figure skaters. They don't have a single figure skating supervisor. They instead have a coach for choreography, a coach for upper body strength, a coach for lower body strength, a, an equipment coach. All of these are helping with their particular expertise to find how can they tweak their area uh, so that we maximize the performance of the individual. So you're going to need a coach. People often say, well, who should that coach be? Well, heck if I know until you figure out what your deficit is. And then I say, reach out, reach out to whomever you think has expertise in that particular area. And the fourth piece is successive, successive uh, refinement over time. So the difference between rehearsal or purposeful practice and deliberate practice is deliberate practice is not about proficiency. It's about continuous improvement over time. And I'm proud to say that deliberate practice is one is I, I'll, I'll be bold here. It's the only the only thing in the field of psychotherapy that has any evidence that shows successive improvement over time when applied. Think about that for a second. We've been training therapists in particular models. The big, um, the big, uh, the the idea du jour is that if we teach you this method, whether that's a trauma-informed treatment approach, that your outcomes will improve. Um, I defy you to show me any evidence of that. I'm not saying that these methods don't help. What I'm saying is that learning them may not make you better, especially if that's not what you need to learn. And by doing deliberate practice, what, we show, what we've shown is slow, steady improvement at the individual level over time, about equal to the rate of change you see in top performing Olympic athletes. This, this to me sounds, the, the picture that I get is the German, I think it was German, a psychologist, Lev Vygotsky, who, who mm. developed the zone of proximal development. Mm. Uh, are you kind of talking about pushing yourself past a limit that you're comfortable with so that you can get better and better at it? And in turn, I mean, we, we do that. We hope to do that with our clients all the time. Mm. Um, mm. And in trauma treatment, like developing that window of tolerance, but being able to develop what we can tolerate um, if we push ourselves further enough, it, it, I see so many parallels with, I always draw on the gym analogy, you know, when we, we you know, train a muscle, we get better at that. But, um, some people push really hard to train in, in terms of MMA and, and mixed martial arts and that sort of stuff, or just bodybuilders, they would push hard until they're really sore the next day. But then that won't do really that, that won't do well over the long term because you know training 
an hour and then you miss a couple of days because you're too sore versus training, you know, an hour on the lower weight um, every single day, you, you aggregate them um, to use your terms more and more and more development and pr process over time. Am I kind of uh, summarizing that accurately in, in what, what you're talking about? Yes. Yes. Although I think the comparison is, is not comparing mixed martial arts performers to one another, but a mixed martial art performer to somebody who's interested in mixed martial arts. And I know that may seem an, an obscure point to make, but no amount of gym work is going to make the beginner a mixed martial arts performer. It's much more complex than that. We need a thorough assessment of where the person is at and then develop trainings at their particular edge. So maybe it's working out in the gym. Maybe for that mixed martial arts performer, a, a bit of choreography Maybe aerobics might be the first place to start. Uh, maybe helping them develop a tolerance for being hurt, uh, but continuing might be where that particular performer needs to go. Once you're within the domain, then you're talking about very small tweaks to push that performer to, to, the, to the next level. So in the field of psychotherapy, when people are first approaching deliberate practice, I think it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. Wait, I got to, and, and I'll tell you the first question I get asked when we start talking about deliberate practice, and I, and I hope I haven't implied otherwise, because I stay in this field and I have for the last 35 years because therapists inspire me. I feel inspired by their continued hopefulness, their dedication to human beings, just how much they just how much they 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 really care. So it's no question in my mind that therapists are a motivated bunch. They 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 do want to improve. But when I so when I start talking about deliberate practice, they're they're usually like, well, just tell me what to do. Tell me what to do and I'll practice it. Let let that sink in because that's that's exactly the problem. Because every person who has a model to sell says, well, then just do this and just do this method and just do this method. Or wait a minute, we forgot about trauma. We didn't re recognize about trauma. You really need to learn about trauma-informed treatments. How do you know that? Because you didn't know anything about it or because in fact, your data showed you, you weren't as effective with that group of people as you thought. It should be the latter criteria, not the former that you use to decide what you're going to train on next. So people say, just tell me what, and I'll do it. And I say, wrong question. First, we need to figure out what your what is. And if you just start going to workshops, again, consider this at least, there is every bit of, of chance that attending that training will make you worse rather than better because it might disrupt virtuous cycles of work that you do. So I take this training thing very carefully. If you have a really top performing martial uh, MMA fighter to use the example that you use, and suddenly they go to a, a workshop that teaches an entirely different style, you think that's gonna improve that person's performance? Well, at least there's a 50% chance it might make that person worse if they start to redo their whole style. This is, this is really interesting. Okay, uh, so George St. Pierre, an MMA fighter, um, was was encouraged by his coach to do gymnastics because it's going to improve his overall technique. And he's like, why the hell would I do gymnastics? And yet uh, it made him a better fighter. Something as, as silly as, uh, well, silly, I mean, in terms of uh, improving your flexibility and now it's, it's instrumental. And in terms of psychotherapists, it's kind of like, okay, um, what is it that somebody could kind of see in my day to day that I didn't really see in myself as a, Hey, you, you kind of suck at this or you're doing pretty good at this. So let's develop this area a little bit more. I like that. I, I really like it. It's kind of like physician heal thyself. Mm. And what you're, what you're highlighting here is what are the factors that have leverage on outcome? So if flexibility in MMA fighting, about which I know nothing, just, just so you know, uh, I, I, any, any of my comments uh, th that sound verbally fluid are just that. They're just words. They're, they're not based on, about, on, on any knowledge uh, what, whatsoever. But uh, 
I can't remember where we were going. Where were we going? Well, we're talking about um, fixing or developing one element of oneself. Ah, leverage on outcomes. You, you've, so if flexibility is what is what helps in MMA fighter, and you find that this particular fighter doesn't doesn't have as much flexibility as they might need, the coach then develops some exercises, gymnastics to help them do that. Perfect. Now the question is, what are those variables? in psychotherapy what do we what do we know what have we trained therapists on for the last 40 years model and technique at most they contribute about one percent now i'm not saying that they are unimportant what i'm suggesting is why is so much time spent on this when they contribute so much yeah i'm so sorry to interrupt Uh, in your in your book heart and soul of change i may have misread it i think Mm. it was an attribution of 15 percent uh, on the model, can you can you say, and you're you're kind of comparing it to one percent now? Has there been new research or new new developments since? Yeah. That? So in 1999, in the first edition of the Heart and Soul, we talked about 15 percent, and and that particular figure was based on Michael Lambert's assessment and guesstimate of the figures. In the intervening years, a fair bit of very sophisticated research has been done, and it turns out that the that the figure is closer to one percent. Okay, this is really interesting. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to throw one at you. Does does that mean that all the research we do to investigate different models and the efficacy of models and putting out what works for different conditions is that a misguided venture in your opinion? Well, it's all. It's all embedded in a paradigm or a framework for understanding the data. If you think of psychotherapy like a medical treatment, let's say open your mouth, let me shine the light, you've got little spots in there, you must have strep throat, I'm gonna give you this antibiotic. The assumption is that in the antibiotic, there's something specific, an ingredient, which is specifically remedial to the disorder, strep throat being treated. It kills the bacteria, you're cured. If you think psychotherapy works like that, then our last 40 years of research have been exactly on point. If you look at the outcomes of that research, which basically find that all of these approaches work about equally well, that any differences are most likely due to differences in methodology and very little to the particular problem being treated or, or the ingredients being delivered, well, then maybe what that calls for is a different view of how we work. So one of the factors that have leverage on outcome, reconnecting this back to where we were before, is that your care has to have a structure, a rationale, a, and an engaging ritual and associated techniques that help you operationalize that rationale for the client. So what is, uh, and so what's effective about CBT is not that you actually confronted dysfunctional thoughts, but rather that the client finds your explanation compelling and is willing to take action in the room or outside of the room with you. Once they get activated, it doesn't really have anything to do with their confronting their dysfunctional thoughts, but that they took a few steps, they feel emboldened, empowered, and they can move on. The point is that it contributes overall very little to the outcome. And if you were coming in to see me as a coach and I didn't have access to your data, I wouldn't assume that that was most likely your problem because there are factors that have much higher leverage on outcome. Let me, let me give you them in order. Next in terms of contribution is the creation of hope and expectancy. So it contributes about 4% to the outcome of, of psychotherapy, 4% of the variance associated with treatment outcomes, hope and expectation. Contributing about twice as much as that, about 8 to 9%, are relationship factors, empathy, goal consensus, congruence, et cetera. So we're starting to get in an area where if I knew nothing about you and I didn't have any access to your data, and I'm just playing the base rates, I would probably assume that any improvement that could take place in your performance would probably 
be had by focusing on your relationship abilities. They likely break down at certain predictable points in your work, maybe with certain kinds of problems, maybe with certain kinds of people, maybe with certain kinds of emotional presentations or interactions in the room. And the, the one of the other factors that contributes a, a slight bit more are what are called therapist factors. Again, about eight to 10%. The therapist's ability to respond in the moment, their ref, level of reflective functioning, et cetera. These are all factors which have leverage on it. So think of the point we're making here. You engage in your performance and we assess. We find that with X kind of client presenting X problem, you're not as effective as you are overall. We then look at that and try to map it onto these factors. Does this have to do with your structuring of the session, model and technique? Does it have to do with the failure to create hope and expectation? Does it have to do with uh, poor engagement of that client or your reaction or lack of reaction to that client? Here are all the factors. Once we map it onto that factors, those factors, we can develop exercises that help you work that factor to your benefit and your client's benefit. So you're putting the onus on the, the therapist um, primarily to, to you know, do the best that you can do and be the best that you can be rather than trying to say, okay, well, this, uh, it's not working. So there must be something wrong with the, the person who's coming to see me. So because we're looking at data in the aggregate, we're able to identify patterns that are recurring, which means that it's about you and that kind of client, not just that client. Now, does this make sense to you? I'm, I'm following. I'm following. These are all a lot okay. of new material. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so now there, there is something to responsiveness because what deliberate practice is about and has to be focused on is something that you have control over. That's not a random event. And when the clients walk in the door, that is a random event. Mm -hmm. And because generally we have little control over who walks through the door. And if you're in private practice or you're working, especially in public health, you don't have a lot of choice about that. You don't get to say, well, I'll see that kind of person, but not this one. I mean, people are flooded with referrals, especially right now in the time of COVID and the pandemic and the tremendous amount of emotional suffering that's taking place given how we're, how we're trying to mitigate uh, the COVID effects. So you have to take whoever walks through the door. What's the challenge in that case? Meeting that unique individual. So think about this. When we look at what factors contribute to outcome, client variability accounts for about 87%. Treatment accounts for about 13 to 14%. So we're always swinging the small end of the bat here, the cricket bat, you know, that's what we're, we're always swinging that small end because the game is so random based on who walks through the door. What can you do in that case? The challenge in that case is to respond to the individual with a hope of two things. Number one, engaging that person and keeping them engaged. And number two, hopefully helping them. In other words, their well-being improves. So responsiveness is one challenge. And it's what we have to do to deal with the very random nature of the work that we do. And this may sound like, oh my gosh, that's, 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 that's very different than medicine. It's the same with medicine. When a surgeon is dealing with a client who's had a heart attack, they're not dealing with the same kind of body and health status every time. That would be fantastic if it would, if it would. But many folks are coming in with a wide range of pre-morbid health prior to their heart attack. Does, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. What yeah, does the sure. physician have to do? Well, they have to respond to the unique properties of that person. We have somebody who has compromised lung function, so I'm gonna have to pay unique attention to that, where I wouldn't have to do that with a younger person who had a heart defect and, and happened to have a heart attack. It's the same in psychotherapy. Responsiveness is challenge one, but that's not what deliberate practice is about. Deliberate practice is about attending to your recurring and ongoing errors, things that you do over and over again, unknowingly, that hold outcomes and engagement of clients on a leash.
I want to I want to uh, tail back to something and kind of follow your journey a little bit because you you used to be a clinician, didn't you, at one point in time? Yeah, I'd still consider myself that. All right. So, do you do you currently see clients? I I don't have an active caseload, and haven't for about the last five years. Okay. Throughout my career, I did, mm. and right now I spend about. 50% of my time researching and writing and about half is in consultation, either directly with clients who are in therapy with somebody else or with therapists who are working with individual clients and trying to do their best job. So, so on a personal level, how has all this knowledge changed when you, when you do see somebody, changed your approach to, to seeing uh, the person in front of you and working with them, or at least when you were seeing clients on a on a you know one to one basis, and even now when you're when you're interviewing and working with clients from a research point of view, uh, do you have any stories on how this sort of orientation has has just looked like in practice for you? Uh, I think in the in terms of the first major difference, if you watch the work that. I did then 30 years ago and now is I'm using standardized measurement tools at the beginning and end of each visit with all of my clients. The reason I do this is I am surprised at how frequently I misunderstand the client according to them and I'm not helping. The most research treatment method in the history of psychotherapy research is CBT. Looking back now, 30 years of, or so of research data, we know exactly how effective it is. 51% of clients. That means you failed hmm, 50% of the time. What are we doing about that? Well, as you highlighted earlier, a very typical response, two things, is to look to the client. What is their resistance to what I'm doing? That's not going to change your behavior much. And the second thing we do is we go to our supervisor and say, what could I do differently? And generally, we're staying within the frame of that supervisor and that therapist. It's usually about refining our technique or adding a particular technique, et cetera. So by measuring, I've become acutely aware of how often I'm not helping. And that pushes me to ask, how can I respond differently to this person? And what is it about me and my work and my style that's getting in the way? That means that practically speaking, I'm reaching out all the time, depending on the deliberate practice objective I've set to various coaches. If I'm working on, if I notice, for example, which I did, that my ability to respond empathically to people who are angry with me, uh, suddenly I, you could see in my data that, that when this took place, my, my, uh, my alliance measure scores were flat. Well, then I, I need help in that particular area to respond empathically. So I'm, it, the difference for me is I'm spending, I have virtually no interest in theories of psychotherapy. I haven't read a book on a theory of psychotherapy for 20 years. <sighs> I find them boring, silly, divorced from reality, decontextualized, absolutely unhelpful, and the research backs me up. Instead, I've got to figure out what do I need to learn? What do I need to overcome? And then make my efforts at professional development more targeted. So what I have become is much more diverse in the coaches that I seek out, much less technique oriented in, in the work that I do. So it, I, I think this is probably some of the main differences you would see. I, I like that. Okay. So a lot of it's just about if I'm hearing you right or understanding you correctly, about how you relate to the person and how you're able to establish a particular bond with that person, understand their, their issues on a very human level and kind of figure out, okay, well, is what I'm doing in, in what I say or how I re react 
um, is that helping them kind of get better? And if we had a measurement to, to use to rate that sort of stuff every single session, then you've, you've got an indication on what you can improve better. I mean, is, is that on the... Well, so of the four factors I mentioned, which is model and technique or, or, or structure, hope and expectancy, relational factors, and the therapist, their self, uh, of, those, of those particular factors, I mentioned one, the relationship. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you follow up because I have been accused of saying, even though I've never said this, well, the relationship is all that matters. I, I've never once in my life said that. But for me, in my efforts to improve, very often I've found that the shortcomings that create random and recurring, or that create recurring and ongoing problems in my work with clients have been in the relational domain. For other therapists, it may be the structure, the focus, the rationale. They just not, might not be spinning the rationale that engages their particular clients, or their rationale may be too tight and, and not allow for and to flexibly accommodate the individual. I don't know. The only way to do that is to measure and then map the performance onto something like the taxonomy of deliberate practice activities, which helps you figure out, well, where is my weakness located? Because as I said, there are a whole host of experts that will tell you what you need to learn. If you say, well, what should I focus on? Ah, here's what you need to learn. It'll just happen to be whatever it is they're selling. I'm not selling anything. I'm, I'm not selling anything except for it's going to take a shitload of work to do what I'm saying. You're going to have to measure. You're going to have to map it onto that. You're going to have to find a coach. You'll have to work on it. And any changes that happen will not be like the miraculous things you witness in video demonstrations at workshops. It's so sort of hallelujah moments. What I might call a tent meeting of psychotherapy with the itinerant priest there saying, if you follow my method, you'll be saved. <laughs> It's, it's so interesting. There's a story about uh, Carl Rogers, who just did his thing connecting with, with people. And for, for those who might not be aware of Carl Rogers, I don't know who listening won't be uh, aware of him, but he was like the first researcher, um, psychotherapy researcher, as well as clinician, as far as I understand. He's the one who took that sort of um, grain seriously, as far as uh, you know, establishing a way of checking in on, on how how clients are going um but but they put him in a room to try to learn his method and had an observation of of people kind of looking in and saying okay well how can we kind of replicate this and it just didn't work I, it, it's it's really interesting how you're so and i think i think other therapies kind of like somatic experiencing therapies which are kind of trauma-based type of therapies which you're constantly connecting with the client and asking, all right, what's happening for you right now as we sit down and how do we kind of um, work through that from a body-based point of view? It's so, it's so different from session to session that you can't necessarily map everything that's going to go out on a one to 10 formula. Uh, and I guess what I'm saying here is being with the client and understanding their their issues and knowing what they're bringing to the table kind of from a medical um, point of view, you, you don't just look at heart disease. You kind of look at everything that they've come, come in with uh, and kind of consider, consider that it's, I think it's a whole paradigm um, challenge for me right now mm. to try to conceptualize it all. Mm. And I hope I'm doing an, a, a adequate job of understanding what you're putting down. So I think you're right that, that, although you don't have to do this uh, in order to start with deliberate practice, I do think it's helpful to consider the paradigm that you operate under. And uh, it, most of us don't think about that because paradigms are a little bit like air. You only notice it when it's foul. Uh, otherwise, you don't even notice your breathing most of the time. So uh, the, the, there are two paradigms and one is clearly dominant. The, the dominant one is, as we've mentioned, the medical paradigm. There's nothing wrong with the medical paradigm. The question is, do the facts accumulated about what we do as psychotherapists fit that paradigm? I'm arguing they do not at all fit that paradigm. And continuing to squeeze our, our round peg into that square hole uh, is ruining psychotherapy. 
and what makes it actually effective to human beings in, in a room uh, working within a particular cultural setting and context. So uh, the other paradigm is what, what has been called the contextual paradigm, which, which, is, which does not assume that psychotherapy functions like a medical treatment and highlights all of the elements in the context that result in clients feeling help. So let me give you an example straight out of Australia. We've just completed and submitted a study that we started three years ago. This is the nature of, of research publications with uh, a bunch of researchers, uh, Chris Pepping and John Farhall, uh, two really interesting folks. I met them at a conference. It must be 2015, 2016. And at the time, we were still trying to understand, well, how would you train deliberate practice? And and I had been interviewing and interacting uh, with, uh, with psychics and tarot card readers and impressed in many cases at their ability to connect and within short measure, have people leaving their, their consultations 20 minutes at times uh, feeling helped. So I suggested to John and Chris and they, they've done virtually all of the work why don't we do a study about this? So we retrieved the 1996 consumer report uh, questions that were used for Marty Seligman's report on psychotherapy, that, that one of the still most cited studies on psychotherapy, 90% of clients enjoy psychotherapy and find it helpful was the, was the main conclusion, all sorts of threats to that, to that, but um, it, it's gotten a lot of, it's gotten a lot of play. And, and, Here's the interesting thing about that particular study. You, you can look it up, Consumer Report Psychotherapy Study 1996, Marty Seligman. About half of the data that was collected had nothing to do with psychotherapists. It had to do with friends, spiritual advisors, and family members and their potential helpfulness. Now, isn't that interesting? None of that data were, none of that data, none of that data was reported. We asked for it. We were told that it didn't exist, but it wasn't reported. And now I think I know why. Because we replicated this study and we included psychics and spiritual advisors. And what we found was they were more helpful than therapists. Okay. Um, do you have time to jump into a, maybe a story about that? Sure. So... The, the point here is that although much maligned, especially since Houdini, and we so, uh, the, the news is always about, hey, this psychic exploited these people by promising to remove a curse for $10,000, you know, all these kinds of things are constantly in the media. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, you've got these very dedicated group of tarot card readers who clients uniformly almost find helpful. And the point is, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? Well, we can explain it. Well, they must be tapping into some cosmic force. Or you can say they're very good at leveraging the four factors we've talked about. They have a method. There's nothing wrong with having a method. I suggest therapists have a method. And it provides a rationale, et cetera. Me generally, these messages create hope and an expectation. You go to see a psychic because you believe they might give you some answers. You feel understood. And generally the psychic is focusing on, one of their first usual questions is, what, what are you here for? What question can I answer? And last but not least, you have this, this healer type person who is watching you, interacting with you, and trying to make sure you get what you came for. Ah. So I'm not suggesting everybody go to psychics. What I am suggesting is the idea that the way we've conceptualized our work is very narrow. And we can expand what we do via deliberate practice by focusing on our performance edge. Do you, do you think there's an element of holding to esteem that person has some sort of hidden knowledge, some gnosis that, that is kind of 
inherited from a spiritual domain to kind of help you get to to where you want to be in terms of the aura or, or what have you so that kind of instills that okay I, I got something out of that well when we looked at what separated and and again you only get answers based on the information you gathered so there could be much more to this story than we know about uh, so when i tell you what the where the differences were it's not saying that that that's the exclusive understanding or interpretation of the findings but turns out that psychics formed better alliances with their clients what is an alliance it's made up of mutually collaboratively determined goals mutually collaborative determined means agreement on my role in the process the second thing that differentiated psychics from therapists was clients perceive them as willing to give more direct suggestions and advice and the third element was it does it does have to fit with how they see the world so could the same be said with um, pastors or priests who? Of who course. Kind of, okay, and <laughs> why isn't that why isn't that acceptable? By professionalizing and locating expertise in a Western materialistic medicalized paradigm, we have effectively disempowered most of the natural healers in our culture. And yet, those this, were the ones that were our therapists for thousands of years uh, and for the general population still yeah okay um i know you have to go in a few minutes but th this has just sparked a whole brain well you know perhaps we should schedule another hour yeah i think so i think so um all right so l let's um let's summarize a little bit uh, is there any kind of closing remarks you'd like to make about what you've just opened up before we Deliberate practice is a marathon, not a sprint. When uh, as, as, as simplistic and silly as it may sound or as commonsensical as it may sound, anybody who's promising you better results if you just do this or that, given the history of our, our field, is not being truthful. Anybody who promises that if you just use this method for that problem, you'll have better results. I, I say, show me the data, show me the data. Better results do not happen in general. They happen at the level of the individual therapist or counselor identifying when they don't do as well as they usually do and working on that. The connection to uh, the study that we've just submitted to the Journal of uh, Mental Health Administration and Policy is, is, is to further break down I think this idea that psychotherapy is a medical treatment that achieves its effects by everybody hewing to the protocol, as opposed to connecting with the individual client, making sense of their experience, providing helpful direction. I mean, when you talk about what we do at that level, it sounds so, of course, commonsensical and simple. Well, as every person knows, once you go in the room, well, it ain't so simple. That's the beauty of the work. That's what keeps me involved. Otherwise, let's just have machines do this. You know, if, if really all it is is following the protocol, you don't need me. I like it. No, thank you so much for the for your time today, Scott. And uh, I remember in a conference that you mentioned that for people, if they want to search you up, don't put Scott Miller, put Scott D. Miller because that's it right. a rock band or, or something. <laughs> that's right. Um, so on, on that point, where, where, what would you like to say uh, to people who want to learn a little bit more about you? I know you've, you've mentioned throughout the interview, but if you could summarize where more and more people could find you, uh, where sure. would that be? Uh, first off, I answer all of my own email. It may take me a day or two to get back to people. It is important to put the D in between Scott and Miller, info at scottdmiller.com. Our most recent book about deliberate practice is out from the American Psychological Association, May 2020, called Better Results. Uh, 
And last but not least, there is an entire community of clinicians available through the International Center for Clinical Excellence. This is a not-for-profit group. I have no particular ideological axe to grind. We're not going to sell you anything. It's just a place where people can meet and discuss these ideas and share their struggles. Uh, for most of us, proficiency is what we want. But for another small group that are bothered by these small errors, deliberate practice is 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 a, is a is an antidote to that and a solution. And, and the, the, the real thing you're going to need is support for the long haul. Well, again, thank you so much, Scott. And I look forward to scheduling another conversation to delve a bit deeper into these these other areas that yeah, perfect look forward to it you've brought up um all right so let, let's let's close there and we'll, we'll take it take it in stride